Hi, everybody. Welcome to Newsnight for Friday, May 6th. Great to have you along. A big week of the election. Surprise, surprise. More local school levies passed than fail. What was the difference? A local high school is told to not only change its building, but possibly change more than half of its staff. And Akron finally has a new man to lead the police department. Those stories and more next on Newsnight. This week indeed, so let's get right to it. Great to have along Ed Esposito here this week from WAKR. And also great to welcome along Steve Hoffman from the Akron Beacon Journal. All right, let me just set the stage. A week ago, bin Laden's alive, Akron doesn't have a police chief, and we all assume that most of these school levies are going down to defeat. What a seven days it has been. Hell of a full moon, huh? <laughs> Wasn't that amazing? Yeah, well, let's start locally, and let's start with these these levies at the ballot. I think all of us were, would have been surprised if half of them had passed based on the economy. Mm -hmm. And in some county alone, Nordonia Hills was the only one that failed. Well, and you look at uh, the spillover, I think, in Stark County. Wasn't Lake the only one that failed, uh, mm -hmm. if memory serves me right? So uh, b big difference between Cleveland area and here. Uh, you know, what are the reasons for it? Lower turnout, uh, maybe that, uh, you know, sort of condenses the... The hard fought yes is the hard fought no's. Maybe the no's thought that there were enough people who were going to show up and who would vote for something like this in a rotten economy that they didn't show up. Uh, you know, it, it, it's an off year election. It's a way off year election. There's no other reason to go but school issues. Um, so, but, uh, but I also think you got to give credit to the schools. I looked at the way uh, Cuyahoga Falls went about their business, uh, Hudson, Green as well. Highland was, uh, you know, in by a, a squeaker. But I think they worked very, very hard, Revere, too, in making a case as to why voters needed to invest at a time when the investment from the state and the federal government couldn't be counted on. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, pattern. Summit County was uh, certainly an outlier in terms of the overall trend in Northeast Ohio and, mm -hmm. and, and the, uh, the statewide trend in Ohio. Voters were not in a mood to approve uh, new money. Mm -hmm. And I believe in three of the levies that passed mm -hmm. in the Summit County were new money. Um, it's hard to figure out, as Ed's uh, implying, with a, when you get these off-year or low turnout elections, they, they can be fluky. I think certainly in a couple of cases, uh, certainly in the Revere uh, situation in Summit County, you had a uh, uh, ver better organized, uh, better funded pro-levy uh, groups than you've seen. So you've got to give them credit for getting out there and raising money. I think uh, the uh, committee uh, in Revere raised $30,000. Uh, I think. Uh, some describe it as a massive campaign. Well, you know, thirty thousand dollars is kind of chump change in yeah, politics. But for, but, but for, but for, school for a school levy, levy mm -hmm. it's a right. right. Uh, in in yeah. context, it's a, signif a significant amount of money. Um, the other thing that may be at work here, and this is kind of hard to tell because there's no exit polling in these little elections and everything, is you know the classic pattern with a lot of these school levies, especially with new money, is you know you get these voters say, let's send Columbus a message. We're going to vote no. Send Columbus a message. They should send us, you know, more money. This is a state responsibility. Well, I, uh, uh, our governor Kasich <laughs> might uh, have sent a message the other direction uh, that's getting through, which is, you know, uh, guys, uh, you're not going to get any more money. In fact, you're going to get less money. You want it? You got to pay for it. Uh, you want it? You got to, uh, you got to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So maybe uh, voters in some of the wealthier suburban districts. Uh, are responding to that message. They're going to, you know, they're taking the brunt of the cuts from the state mm -hmm. uh, and they're stepping up to the plate. The sad thing in the long term, I mean, you know, we've said this many times, the sad thing in the long run is when you get uh, wealthier suburban districts that are able to tap their voters, mm -hmm. get the money, you get it, this increasing uh, patchwork system of local school districts, some well-funded, some not, um, maybe not the best uh, way to move the whole uh, mm -hmm. state forward. The, the dynamics <coughs> of election day, you know, 72 hours leading up to it, we had the royal wedding and we have bin Laden killed right. and we have a downpour <laughs> on election day. Right. And I wondered how all of those things would, would favor distractions and challenges for people to get to the polls. Turnout was about 23 percent. You know, I always say if it's cold and rainy, I mean, you're going to lose 5 percent right off the bat from people that are just going to say, are you nuts? Or they're going to put it off and they're just going to miss it entirely because they'll want to get home to dinner. In this case, it may have benefited the supporters, but what can <coughs> other districts in, in Summit County, specifically Akron, which hasn't had to have a levy for several years now, likely will have a levy in either 2012 mm -hmm. or at the most 2013, 
what can they take away from from this you know i think uh... i think the poster child it was interesting uh... looking at revere uh... because i don't think you would have seen the level of support of organized support steve uh... you know in in terms of actually massing their strategies toward how they were going to win if they hadn't had such organized opposition mm -hmm. last time i think that really set a bar uh, not necessarily among the administrators or the, the true believers, if I could use that phrase for a school levy, mm -hmm. but I, th I, th I think it really scared the parents uh, and people who believe that the schools are a linchpin uh, toward maintaining their property values and toward uh, you know giving their kids a, a leg up and having a good you know getting their money's worth for what they get to the school district. I think that's the kind of argument Akron and other districts would do well to look at and emulate. Uh, I live in Nordonia Hills, and looking at the differences between the last two times when it failed and this third time when it failed uh, were striking in terms of the arguments they were making and the outreach that they were making into the community. Yeah, I, I, in terms of the message, the the core message in the levy campaign, uh, I think you got to be somewhat careful. The hidden reservoir, if you will, in a suburban district are the people who've moved there because of the schools. Most people who are moving mm -hmm. to those districts. So y y if you can focus on them and kind of ignore, you know, not stir up the antis too much, that's harder to do in a district like Akron. Uh, I think the message in Akron has got to be more um, focused on jobs and the economy. That if you do not have a solid school district in a city like Akron, you are not going to have the educated workforce. Uh, you're not going to get the bang for your buck in that respect. Because uh, Akron's really not yeah. in a position as a big urban district to share resources with a like district like the suburbs are. But speaking of the Akron schools, a significant announcement this week that Bookdale High School, among three schools, but the uh, Bookdale cluster, the most significant, has scored so low that the state has ordered a complete revamp of that school <laughs> to include applying for new grants, creating a tech school. No more than 50% of the staff can stay. Uh, it's a, both a shot in the belly and a shot in the arm that your scores are so bad, we got to do something drastic. But your teaching staff, more than half of them will likely be gone. You're, yeah. in, you're in an environment now where voters are applying business techniques and looking how government operates. Uh, and a business technique is uh, that you're allegedly rewarded for performance and punished for non-performance. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of reasons why there are issues in the Bucktail cluster that go far and above beyond what teachers get paid, what administrators get paid what the buildings look like, but uh, there are also limitations as to what school systems can do. Uh, but in this case, uh, you know, you clearly have a policy here where the state is saying, if you don't meet this level, then it's going to trigger this and this and this, and that's what happened. Yeah. Uh, and, and if you're a parent of a book to cluster student, your question is, uh, I, I don't care about the yin and yang, I just want my kid to read and write. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, this is uh, kind of a Hail Mary, it seems to me. I mean, this is a $500,000 program to, to bring in this technology-based uh, problem-solving model. Uh, it sounds good, uh, but uh, I, I think, as Ed's suggesting, there are uh, many, many issues. The curriculum is just one of them. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder whether uh, there's some discussion that the type of curriculum, this high-tech uh, model, will attract teachers into the building. Um, Again, uh, we'll see. Um, they Clearly, they had to do something. I want to mm -hmm. stay with this discussion a little bit longer before we shift to the web. Uh, this is not necessarily a knock on the teachers right. uh, because you know certainly they can only do what teachers can do. It also allows an opportunity for teachers who would like to teach somewhere else to allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but what does it say about saying, if you don't want to be here, you don't have to be here. And if you really want to be here, now is your time. Well, there might be. I think the STEM schools had some success with attracting teachers who mm -hmm. like this method. Uh, uh, from my understanding of it is, is that it's a lot of work. Uh, the lesson plans are a little different. In other words, instead of teaching discrete units of this and that and trying to glue them together as best you can, the, the uh, uh, academic skills are clustered around solving a problem. So all, a lot of things are brought to bear on a specific problem. Uh, it could be writing skills, math skills, science skills, all kind of targeted. Kind of more experiential. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, I, I, you know, that's challenging. It's exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, it might work better with some kids, I think. But it sure, uh, it's a lot of work. So it just, I think it depends on if you enjoy that kind of thing. Uh, I hope they'll be able to attract as many people as, as they can. I, 
just off the top of my head, I, I'm not sure if you can attract half your staff mm -hmm. uh, to come in. I, they may have to assign people. Well, this is this, this is a is school district or a school that just had a Gates scholarship winner, has had tremendous academic success, uh, and is getting a $46 million new campus. I want to continue this discussion now over on Newsnight.net. For more Newsnight content, including extended discussions, full interviews, and the chance to speak your mind about the issues, join us online at Newsnight.net. Again, you can watch the extended edition of our interviews and learn more about what's going on here at Newsnight.net. We'll have Ed back in a moment, but great to invite along Phil Trexler from the Akron Beacon Journal to our discussion this week. And just before the broadcast, I tweeted that uh, I can't wait to see what the city of Akron announces on Friday afternoon this week. <laughs> uh, a jab because we taped this show on uh, Friday mornings. And last week we talked about uh, the Akron pay, not coming to the police officers, and the search for police chief, lo and behold, at 4 o'clock. Both issues get resolved. Yeah. Thank you, Mark Williamson. <laughs> <laughs> and we teased um, him along. But uh, we do have a new police chief announced on Friday, introduced on Monday. Yeah, uh, finally. Uh, so we've been without a permanent chief in Akron since uh, December 2008. And uh, now we have a G-man mm -hmm. who is going to uh, lead the department here into uh, 2011 and, and beyond. Um, James Nice is his name. He's a Kenmore guy, uh, 26 years with the FBI. Mm -hmm. Done a lot of work with uh, against street gangs. Uh, brings a lot of credentials mm -hmm. from the federal department. Uh, on the other side, we don't know about his management skills. We, you know, certainly he's never led a department of 400 and plus men. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you and know, we've got a lot of mixed reactions, I, I found, in talking to some of the folks in the department. A lot of mixed reactions. Um, nice guy, certainly qualified to lead the department with all the experience that he has. Um, it, it will be interesting to see uh, how he does the dance keeping the guys happy, keeping the mayor happy, um, bringing these innovations that the mayor talks about when, uh, you know, buying new gadgets and whatnot when they can't afford to pay the policemen that they have. That'll be interesting to see. Um, he's, uh, you know, of course, never been a patrolman, never issued a speeding ticket, never, you know, gone to a domestic uh, fight. Um, so there, it's, it's interesting. And there's also some talk, too, because there were three finalists for the, for the position. He was one of the three. And two of the three pretty much backed out, leaving uh, you know Jim Nice as the as the guy. So um, I think the people in the department are going to give him a chance, and uh, we'll see where it goes. You know, he was a little short on answers. I thought at the press conference, they couldn't talk about regionalism, couldn't talk about the contract. Um, you know, FBI guys are not used to talking to the public. We'll see mm -hmm. how that goes, and and you know, there's there's still that uh, you know that white elephant, big elephant in the room there, and that's the racial relationships within the city. Sure. And uh, so that's... I, I was not there because I was out chasing all the bin Laden reaction, but one of the sound bites that I heard uh, was him talking about, you know, I was ready to retire. And I, I took that as, well, then why are you taking this role where, you know, the city certainly hopes you're going to be here, you know, a little longer mm -hmm. than a couple of years. It's yeah. a homecoming for him. You know, he's he has a house. He's had a house here for six years down by the Portage Lakes, uh, dating a school teacher mm -hmm. from Akron. Uh, you know, he was looking forward to selling back down, and I don't know if this is the kind of job you retire to. I mean, there, there's, it's, there's a lot of work involved here, and, uh, the, you know, I've talking to the chiefs in, in the past, it was, it, there's a crisis of the day that they got to deal with every day. And um, we'll see. I, I certainly he has the experience, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of being a law, in law enforcement. Also be interesting, too, because, you know, he won't be able to make arrests. He's, he doesn't have... Well, the chief doesn't make arrests. Well, he anyway. doesn't, He doesn't. but, you know, but to the guys, he, even the question came out, are you going to wear a uniform? And he said, well, if the guys, you know, if it's okay with the guys, I'll wear a uniform. You know, I, I granted, he doesn't make arrests. Certainly, he doesn't make arrests. But it's just, it's very, he's going to be an administrator. And um, we'll see how well he can administrate. You know. This is an important watershed for the department. It's certainly, we've been talking about it for a long time. Um, I think you have to approach this with a sense of balance. Uh, certainly, you know, Akron is not a crime-ridden city. Uh, Akron, uh, the police department is not broken, uh, hopelessly, bro but it has uh, had its problems. Mm -hmm. uh, it has had its uh, problems with the community. And uh, I think, you know, uh, what the mayor has had in mind is bringing in someone from the outside. Uh, there's no need for uh, the new chief to reinvent 
everything. But I do think, you know, moving forward, he does, I agree Phil, with Phil, he does sound somewhat cautious. But I, I think there is a sense that the department um, needs to change, needs to evolve, uh, and embrace new, some new ways of doing things, especially when it comes to community policing. And uh, that's not a matter of gadgets. It's mainly a matter of, uh, of just the philosophy. Um, and I think, uh, you know, there needs to be a better <coughs> relationship. And I think we're, st hopefully, we're starting to see that with this, the mayor backing down on this pay cut, uh, the, the pay issue, uh, re restoring the raises. So uh, hopefully it's a, you know, it's, it's a good thing. Um, this idea of bringing chiefs up, new, every new chief up from within the ranks uh, is not necessarily the best model. Uh, that, that's not to say it should never happen, but I think uh, you do need uh, occasionally to look outside and, um, you know, this guy seems to uh, have the street credentials, at least, uh, mm -hmm. to understand, you know, what goes on in a big city um, and, and, and how to deal with it. Because the idea behind this generated from the mayor himself, and he has for several years now said this was going to be his plan, how much pressure is there on him that he made the right choice? Oh, I think there's a lot of pressure. Yeah, yeah there, I think I, I agree with you. Um, this has to work out. Other cities have tried to bring guys out. I, you know, I go back to the 1980s when, uh, you know, Dennis Kucinich went outside the department to bring in uh, uh, Angusto or whatever. Angisto, I think. Angisto from uh, <laughs> San Francisco didn't work out so well. Yeah, this will work out. I mean, I mean he, Jim Nice is a solid lawman. It's going to work out. He, is he more of a commissioner, administrator? Yeah, more that's than how it's going to be. That's how it's going to be. He, you know, he's 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 going to put out the fires that have to be put out every day. He's going to, uh, you know, the big thing is he's going to have to relate to the community. Uh, you know, how is he going to react when you got people marching on the police department and his union decides to have an anti-protest? Mm -hmm. You know, Mike Matulovich was there. You know, um, will Jim Nice be there? You know, when the, when the rally, the police support rally, those are going to be interesting things to see because the FBI is not, they don't, they're not accustomed to public relations work. Let's face mm -hmm. it, you know. Um, they operate behind the scenes and low key, and uh, he's going to be the face of the department. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that pans out. I, I know that over the years, Craig Gilbride, Larry Givens, Gus Hall, Mike Matulovich all went out in uniform and rode with these guys, even mm -hmm. as chief. They would sure. ride along, uh, just refreshing their own skills getting out there. And as you mentioned, Phil, one of the things I've heard from the officers this week is this guy's never written a traffic ticket, he's never kicked mm -hmm. in a door uh, on a domestic. Uh, he's always been big picture FBI stuff. Right. It, is there going to be a disconnect because he doesn't have that experience? And if you remember too, when Phil Young was brought in as the auditor, that was one of the major complaints about him. Is that all, that's all he ever did in his life was write tickets as a as a state trooper. And uh, I, you know, there's he's going to have to win over the department. There's no question about it. And uh, I I think that he has the ability to do that. He he didn't come across as very charismatic and outgoing and very gregarious, but, you know, if he's solid, if he's reasonable, if he's fair, mm -hmm. I think eventually, you know, the, the guys will accept him. Yep, and we'll be talking about him and invite him on here in the coming weeks here on Newsnight. On Newsnight.net, we cover a broader range of topics than we can on the air in 27 minutes. Be part of the conversation on our Facebook page and at Newsnight.net. Look up in the sky. It's not a blimp anymore. Good you're getting out of the blimp business, so to say getting into the Zeppelin business. We, we appreciate our blimps here in Akron, oh, though. You, know, <laughs> you guys on. are making way too No, much. I'm serious. Yes, it is on. cool. I, you know, I live in Montrose, and how cool is it to take your kid out and say, hey, look up in the sky. There, you know, I, I live the in bump. Sagamore Hills. Every time they're going up to Quicken Loans cool. Arena, I'd say, yeah, I'd sit on the deck and watch them. It's but cool. It, but if you're from the Akron area, you can be in your kitchen with the window open, and right. you hear it, and you know it's a blimp. Sure. You know it's not a helicopter. Right. You know it's not a plane. You know it's a blimp. Mm -hmm. And you only know that if you're let from me, the Akron area. Let me ask you a serious question. Do you, honest to God, think people are going to look up now and go, there's the Zeppelin? They're going to say, there's the blimp. It right. doesn't matter if it's a Zeppelin or a blimp. It doesn't matter what the engineers well, call it. People, people don't spell Zeppelin it correctly. It's so still going to be called a blimp. <laughs> that, that. Come on. <laughs> it's cool. It is cool. It is cool, it's but it is a cool. blimp. And they're going to make them here. Yeah. And so, that, you know, the, so life is good. <laughs> <laughs> but, but as an icon for the city, is, it's an interesting transition. Yeah. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm for blimps. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we had more. Right.
You got two of them out of Right, exactly. And if anybody, three on the set right and if anybody's now, sitting at home on. making blimp jokes about me and Ed. <laughs> we'll be the first one to laugh. I mean, these are the. It's not funny. Yeah, I guess, yeah, sure it is. Come on. I guess the question becomes with all the things going on at Goodyear and in the industry, why <laughs> mess with that? They're not messing with it. This is the next generation of airships. They make airships. What difference does it make if they're blimps or zeppelins? They're being made right in the, right here. I mean, and you know, let, uh, let's be honest about it. We still refer to Akron as the rubber city. Yeah. The only rubber that they're making anymore is is <laughs> racing tires. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the polymers. Uh huh. Like rubber, but not so much. Right. Yeah. It, I, I don't think it hurts one bit. In, as a matter of fact, it's great news because they're going to make the next generation of airships for Goodyear mm -hmm. here in Akron or here in a township near Akron. Right. Uh, you know, but but it's certainly this is still the home of Goodyear. This is still the home of the Goodyear blimp, whether the engineers call it a Zeppelin or a Who's a Flop It or whatever they call it. It's still going to be referred to as a blimp. I guarantee you when the networks come on there, when Jim Nance talks about whatever it is that's flying high above Firestone, mm -hmm. it won't be a Goodyear blimp. It'll probably be a MetLife blimp or a, the Snoopy blimp or yeah. something like that. It doesn't matter. They're still going to call it a blimp. Yeah. A blimp is a blimp is a blimp. And right. just as we always, you know, we consider, you hear Akron, you think blimps, along with a few other things. Mm -hmm. When you say Kent State around the nation, one of the things that comes up is May 4th. And one of the things we talked about off camera was the lack of coverage this year from the media this week for May 4th. Does it still have relevance or was there just so much done in the 40th that it wasn't as I interesting? It, I think that's what it was. Is that, you know, we all, you know, we did a, the big splash on the 40th anniversary. Uh, we in the media are very big on round number anniversary dates, and mm -hmm. I think that's what it was. I mean, Kent State obviously honors it every year as they should, and and, and, and we've all picked up a little bit about you know here it is, and mm -hmm. I, you know it's been 41 years. I mean, what else, what more is there to say? And you know, it's 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 still relevant and it's still honored and acknowledged, and it's it's out there, and we've talked about it. Does the university try too hard? To keep it alive, I think there are some that do. I, I, you know, I'm, mm, I'm, a, I'm very, to. I'm very contrary and all that. You know, I, I would, I'm looking at the four people that are five people, five of you students that are in our studios here on Franklin Hall, Kent State. Mm -hmm. Raise your hands. How relevant is May Fourth, 1970, to you? Yeah. But you You're know what? Raising your hands. Well, so slowly you raise your hands. But there you go. There. But you live on campus, right? You live here, and you're going to school here. I think to, to Phil's point, it's been 41 years. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. what else are you going to say? I, I know there are some people that say, hey, there's new evidence of this or that based on this kind of tape, and that's fine, but uh, I, I, think, I think most people have moved on. But mm -hmm. it's a requirement in administration to acknowledge it. Here it is. Sure. Here on it is. Campus it, it is. Right. The administration has to do right. something about it, otherwise they will feel the wrath of, uh, you know, the task force and if, whatnot. If, if you feel it didn't yeah. get enough coverage, wait nine years. Mm -hmm. Right, then it'll be 50, 50 and then right. it'll be a huge again. And right. Yeah, it was, uh, I think they gave it the proper. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so many other things have happened since then. When you do talk about Kent State, there are other things that come to mind, including the sports programs and other folks that have come out of here. When you used to say the Ohio National Guard in the late 70s, people would bring up Kent State. No longer the case at all mm -hmm. uh, with how much the Guard has played a role in, in operations overseas. Because the Ohio National Guard is fighting on two war fronts, maybe three if they were mm -hmm. right. get snookered in Olivia. Right. So, yeah, I think it's I think that focus is really. <coughs> and changed. now's not the time to go criticizing the National Guardsmen. No so, right. so, to turn the spotlight back on the media, is the media being more responsible then by not overblowing something every year just to fill the paper, just to fill the the time that well, we have? I, on there's the not air? a whole lot of news there to talk about either. Mm -hmm. I mean, they they have the. Commemoration. I, I think last year they talked a lot about the new audio tape that right. came out and whatnot. And they were trying to push that this time. I mean, you know, yeah. what are the first three letters of new? <laughs> of news. <laughs> I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not new. Right, exactly. You stole that from somebody. <laughs> of course I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's not who had it first, it's who had it last. <laughs> well, speaking of news, we have a few minutes left. The Akron broadcast industry lost a key player from its past this week. <clears throat> and this struck a, a chord with you. Well, you know, uh, Rudy Pekarski is uh, someone that a lot of people grew up listening to. He was on uh, WAKR. Uh, for years, he was on WSLR, the old Whistler, for a long time. He was on WHLO until uh, just recently. I think he was on WCER down in Canton. Uh, you know, Rudy was one of those guys who was just uh, iconic in terms of high school sports from uh, uh, having his own trophy shop, which obviously uh, served the Scholastic uh, Awards, uh, you know, market. Uh, but he was also a guy who was involved in uh, local baseball, 
uh, you know, certainly recognized for his service at the University of Akron. This guy lived, breathed, uh, ate, lived local sports, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether it be high school or college. He, you know, he really walked a walk and believed in what he was doing. Some of the stories you hear about coming out of Rudy right now, I mean, it just, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it, the business has, has, has vastly changed. Uh, Rudy would go out and buy time on the radio stations and then, then do the local games and sell them himself. So from a business standpoint, I mean, when you listen to, I mean, Rudy had, you know, timeout sponsored. He had the time sponsored. <laughs> you know, the, the, this call on the clock with 4.15 left to go is brought to you by, I mean, you know, Rudy did every. There were times when Rudy would call a game sitting in the back of his car, uh, you know, in the end zone. Uh, you know, watching what was, you know, God, you know, how did he even know what was happening downfield is beyond me. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know he, he, he was that breed that uh, I, I think really made uh, uh, coverage of Akron local sports distinctive and different. He was a character mm -hmm. in his own way, mm -hmm. uh, but he was certainly a trailblazer, a guy who did it for a long time. Yeah. I thought, too, I thought, too, uh, kind of dovetailing on that a little bit, we did uh, have an interview this week with the, the Springfield Patrolman, Mark Dolez, Mm -hmm. uh, who was left paralyzed uh, from a car crash. And, and along the same lines as, as being remembering about uh, Rudy, I, a lot of us came away really impressed with uh, Mark's positive attitude. Here he's dealt phenomenal. phenomenal. He's, he's dealt, you know, a, a life-altering uh, change. And the guy is just upbeat and positive and uh, just wanted to plug the, the fundraisers that the Springfield police are doing for him and his family. And, um, you know, it's just, he was an inspiration. It's a guy who was dealt a mm -hmm. bad blow and is coming out positive and talking, you know. That the guy with the family, the, right? Right. The family, the two young daughters, the ages three and four. Mm -hmm. And here he is, 32 years old, and he's paralyzed. Hit by a drunk driver. Hit by or a, a suspected a, drunk suspected driver. Suspected drunk driver. And, and uh, you know, he's out there protecting and serving us. And sure. He's, his life is altered. And, and a good what way a great to, add, to send prayers mm -hmm. for him. Phil, Ed, thank you so much. Thanks to Steve as well. And thanks for joining us. Again, you can watch the extended edition on Newsnight.net. See you next Friday.